Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice and myself and our ministry, greetings. We want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious, the holy, the awesome. name above Amen. all names, Amen. the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. And we're so blessed that you can be joining us for this time in God's Word. Welcome back. Hallelujah. Uh, we left off in our last program, we were talking about, now we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount as the training in righteousness that Jesus gave to his disciples before he sent them out into the world as the light and the salt, right? And we're in that prayer, that model of prayer that he gave us as, as how we should pray. Yes. What is typically called the Our Father, Okay. And we left off last week talking about the, where Jesus said, here's what he wants us to pray. Mm -hmm. Forgive us our debts. This is speaking to the Father. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Matthew 6, 12. That sound dangerous? Mm -hmm. You're asking God not to forgive you any better than he for, you, know, you forgive others. That's right. And by the way, Jesus continues on, you know, two verses down to say, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Well, we know, you know we're talking about righteousness. Righteousness is that salvation. It is the free gift of God. It comes from the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, we were bound to the law under the obligation of the law. Right. <clears throat> we're no longer under the law. And we talked about this a, a few programs Steps back. back right. That doesn't mean that, we're not, that the commandments are too blown out and tossed out the window. Mm -hmm. You see, now, rather than doing things, godly things, obeying God, out of compulsion, out of obligation, we do it out of love. Amen. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Right. We still got to do it. And the greatest one of those is about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Because without his forgiveness, when he hung on that cross and looked down at us, a world of sinners, throughout the ages, people who had transgressed him, mm -hmm. And Jesus hung on that cross in the horror, the shame of that cross, and prayed, Father, forgive yeah. them. And had he not done that, there would be no hope. We wouldn't be here, I promise you, we'd not be here today. And, and I dare not think about what I might be doing were I not doing this. Yeah. So, this is about forgiveness. That's where we left off, but we're not through yet. Yeah. Because you have to understand something. I, I wrote a book, which it's in the process right now called The Schemes of the Devil and the Triumph of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because the Word says that we're not to be unaware of His schemes. He comes. He comes as a thief, right? He comes to kill. He comes to steal. He comes to destroy. What He wants to destroy ultimately is our relationship with God. Because that is death when we are separated from God. He wants to sever that He, he wants to sever that connection. Mm -hmm. But he can sever that connection between you and God, between me and God, if he can connect, if he can sever my connection between me and Alice, right. between me and you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's, you know, Jesus told the parable, he said, here's the way it is. On that day, Jesus will say to those who are coming into the kingdom, right? And he's going to say, you fed me when I was hungry. Mm -hmm. You visited me when I was sick in prison. And, and people will say, when did I do that? And he said, what you did to the least of my brethren, you did unto me. Right. And what you have not done to my brethren, you have not done for, my, for me either. You see, if you want to forgive your brother, if you have that barrier, that division between you and your brother, you've got a barrier and a division between you and the Lord. 
And what you're doing is you're playing into the schemes of the devil, and you're making him very happy. You're making the devil happy, and That's I promise right. you, you're not making the Lord happy. No. It says, you know, Paul talks about this so much. And if you just go, just for example, go start, just read the first letter to the Corinthians and mm -hmm. see how much division plays into this. Yes. Because a body that's divided is a body that can't function. No. No. And that's what he wants. He wants to stop this body, this, this body of believers from functioning. And he can do that by lack of forgiveness. Lack of forgiveness is, by definition, division. Mm -hmm. It brings division within the body. And as you said before, the, the unforgiveness can physically cripple you. Absolutely. And I mean, that's what it does to the body of Christ. It, it cripples it. I mean, we have literally, over the last four decades, I and mean, we have seen people from the bitterness of unforgiveness mm -hmm. yes. literally crippled both in the natural and in the spirit. Yes, absolutely. And that, again, is a desire of Satan to do to the body of Christ, yes. is to cripple it, yes. to make it ineffective. Right. Function and, you know, the word says we're not to be unaware of his schemes. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with here right now. And I just want to talk about unity for a minute. Unity, unity is the other side of the coin. Unity is the opposite of division, right? right. Yeah. I was, years ago, and I, I, I know I've shared this, but perhaps you've not heard me share it, so I'll do it again. Uh, a number of years ago, I was over in Uwande, the capital of Cameroon, West Africa. And I, I had been teaching there for a week, and I was teaching... A, a large group of pastors, pastors from all over, not only from Cameroon, but from other parts of Africa and from Europe and even in the Caribbean. And as I was teaching them, it was the last night of this conference. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, but it just struck me because they were all leaving the next day. This was the end of the conference. The next day they'd be going back, driving back, which is a dangerous thing in parts of Africa, to Africa, to, to all the places I mentioned. And I stopped and I said to all these pastors, I said, I want to ask you a question. If you knew, without any doubt whatsoever, that tonight was your last night on earth, that you wouldn't make it home tomorrow, whatever the reason, that today was your last day on earth and tomorrow you wouldn't make it to your home, how would that affect the way you are praying now? Think about the things that you're praying for. It doesn't mean you're praying for bad things, but I mean, think about what you're praying for. A lot of times, I mean, you're praying for a new house, you're praying for a new car, you're praying for... Think about the things that you're praying for. But if you knew that you wouldn't be there after tomorrow, how would that impact your prayer life? How would that change your prayer life? You see, because that's exactly what happened with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. On the night he went into the garden, he knew it was over. His prayer life, I promise you, was focused. Mm. So what did he pray for? I'm going to tell you what he prayed for. That you and I, that we, that the body of Christ would be one. Even as he and the Father mm. are one. Prayed for unity. He prayed for unity. That's how important it is. But I want to tell you, here's the good news. Mm -hmm. James wrote and said, The effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Mm. Jesus Christ prayed that prayer. It's going to happen. It already has happened. Yes. Once he prayed. And once he prayed, it's a done deal. But some of us may go kicking and screaming, but there will be unity in the body. You know, there's going to be a separation between the wheat and the tares. That's that's going to happen, okay? It's manifesting. It is. It's absolutely it is. Lack of forgiveness is the tool of division. It leads, as I said, to it leads to bitterness, it leads to misery both in the natural and in the spirit, right? But what I want to focus on for a minute is the results of division. If, if you're conscious of how important this is, what the results of division are, maybe it'll change your attitude towards it. Why is the devil, why is Satan so focused on dividing us? You see, it's important that we understand the consequences of allowing division to take hold in the body of Christ. We need to be aware of the results of falling into the snare of that old trapper. Yes. So we don't treat this issue lightly. Mm -hmm. So the things I want to look at is, and I, okay, I'm going to tell you eight things. Get your pencil, your paper, your notes. And by the way, as I've said over and over, test what I say in the Word and see if it is not the Word of God. If it is not the Word of God, don't pay any attention. It, fortunately, you're, you can't throw spitballs at me or anything. Apples are rotten out. We're not close enough. 
pray for me. But the fact of the matter is, if it is the word of God, you had better do what God has spoken. Amen. Our division, keeping us apart, lessens the manifestation of the presence of God. The second thing is, our division impedes, hampers, and hinders our prayer life. Our division weakens us. Our division hampers our evangelism. Our division slows or prevents God, the potter, from perfecting us. Our division infects and affects our praise and worship. Our division blocks the Lord from meeting our needs. And the last one is our division separates us from the Lord. Now we're going to take a close, closer look at each one of those because it'll help us to resist the devil. Yes. Not being ignorant of his schemes so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. The first thing I said was that our division, keeping us apart, lessens the manifestation of the presence of God. For Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three have gathered in my midst, in my name, there I am in their midst. Right. He wants to keep us apart. Yes. He doesn't want to see us come together and find Jesus in our midst. The Lord's presence is assured to all who are led by His Spirit. Walking in righteousness, guided by His Word, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, mm -hmm. made manifest in many ways because of His promise, that your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have, for He Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. He won't leave us. Yeah. But people have left him. Yes. Okay, that being the case, Scripture indicates that his promised presence manifests itself in many ways. Many ways. Many different ways. Many avenues, right? Mm -hmm. He inhabits the praises of his people. Right. He is the Word of God. Yes. We are his temple. There's a yes. lot of ways. But I'll tell you what, when you, when you break the division, or when you have division, all of a sudden, that's out. Yeah. Our division impedes, hampers our prayer life. In Matthew 18, 19, we're still here, mm -hmm. Jesus said, Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. If we're in agreement in our prayers, God responds. What happens when we're in disagreement? Well, we're not going to pray together. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't even want to see each other. And think about this one. And husbands, pay attention. Peter wrote, You husbands, in the same way, Live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. 1 Peter 3, 7. See, and, and Paul, the Apostle Paul also wrote, There is one body, one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Ephesians chapter 4. I read verses 4 through 6 and verse 32. Amen. Our division weakens us. Two are better than one, it says in Ecclesiastes 4, because they have a good return for their labor. And if one can overpower him who is alone, Two can resist him. Mm -hmm. A cord of three strands is not easily torn apart. Mm -hmm. There is indeed yes. strength in numbers. Yes. When we separate ourselves, we you ever see, it's I it's mean, different. you ever see any documentaries about how mm -hmm. predators hunt in Africa? You know, you see, they go after the, the straggler. They go after the one who's out by himself. That's the way it works. I hear people praying for revival all the time. Oh, we want to see evangelism. We want to see evangelism. We want to send evangelists out. But think about this. Think about what Jesus prayed in that garden that night. He prayed that we would all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. John 17, 21. Yes. Yeah. Our division hides the presence of Jesus Christ. Yes. Two verses later, he says, I in them and you in me, 
that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Our division hides the presence of Christ. Our division hides the love of Christ. Yes. Our division is such an abomination, it should make us sick to our stomachs. I said, in, you know, the fifth thing I said was our division slows or prevents God, the potter, from perfecting us. Think about what I just read. That we may be perfected in unity from above, right? That, that verse, John 17, 23. We are perfected in unity. You have things that I desperately need. I have things that you need. The body works that way. You know, it's not for nothing that the Apostle Paul shows the analogy of the body of Christ being like the human body. Mm -hmm. You know, what part of my body don't I want, don't I need? Right, right. Say, I'm mad at you, Hand. I'm not going to ask you for a while. All right. Tie you well, behind my back. Because this is the way God perfects us. Don't you know that it's, it says in Proverbs, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. It is that coming together, even when we're rubbing together, God is using that to perfect us. And Paul wrote to his first letter to the Corinthians, he said, now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and same judgment. First Corinthians 1.10. That's how we are made complete. And John wrote in his first letter, If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. If we love one another. If you, if you have division between brother, if you have a brother you've not forgiven, a brother or a sister, you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. you are stopping the work of God in your very own life. Yes. You can sit there all day long and make excuses and, you know, justify your what you're doing. What you need to do is fall on your face and repent. Then you need to run, not walk, you need to run to that brother or sister and ask for their forgiveness. I don't care if they're wrong. Doesn't matter. When Jesus hung on the cross what and forgave you, do? you weren't right. Yeah. What did he do? He wasn't forgiving you because you were nice. The sixth thing was our division in infects and affects our praise and our worship. Yes. Romans 15, Paul wrote to the church at Rome and said, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. For Romans 15, 5 and 6. You're not going to have that praise and worship yeah. <clears throat> without, the, without the unity of the body. It's not going to happen. And if anybody's telling you that you can't, they're lying to you. Mm. And I'll tell you who the father of lies is. Oh, and I have to, because you already know. know. Yes, yes. This one you're going to like. Do you ever look around? Is there need in the body of Christ? Mm -hmm. Do you see people in the body of Christ lacking? <coughs> Do you? Do you? Yeah. Our division hampers God's ability to bless us by meeting our needs. Now you may say, how can I stop God from... I'm going to tell you how. In Acts chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 32, 33, and 34. It says, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all, for there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales. There was a time in the body of Christ where there was no need among them. It was a time that they were of one heart and one soul. It was a time of true unity in the body. It makes perfect sense. It's totally logical when you consider that it's written... For this, talking about abundance, is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that their abundance also may become a supply for your need, that there may be equality as it is written. 
He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. Second Corinthians eight thirteen and fifteen. I've said this for years. Years. God has promised, and I'm going to tell you something. He's been faithful to us in His promise. He says it through to Paul's writing to the church at Philippi. He said, "My God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus." But the truth of the matter is, that if I have a need in my life, God is going to supply that. But he is, like, he is as likely, no, he is more likely to give the thing that I need to that person, that brother, or that sister over there. You say, now why would he do a thing like that? Well, why when your belly gets hungry, does your hand have to reach down and get food? Why does your mouth have to chew it? Why does the body have to operate as a whole just to fill the need in your, in your stomach? You see, I'll tell you why. Because that brother, that sister that God gave that thing to, who didn't need it, now has abundance. They have something they don't need. So when they see my need, and they should see it because they love me, when they see it, they got this fun and say, oh, here, I can satisfy that need. That's the way it was operating in the early church. And you want to know something? Listen to this. When, you, when somebody does that and they give me that thing that I need, I get blessed. But interestingly, I get blessed as much as they do. For Jesus said, it is better to give than to receive. They get more blessed than me. So what happens is there's greater blessing in the body of Christ. That's the plan of God. It is based on unity in the body of Christ. Satan wants to stop it, and he can do it when you don't forgive somebody, when you divide yourself from them, because they're not being nice to you. Like I said before, our division separates us from the Lord. Yes. Satan's ultimate desire is to separate us from Jesus, thus from the Father. That's his ultimate desire. That's death. Mm -hmm. And he comes to kill. What we don't seem to realize, but that devil knows well, and this is what I was saying, is that it is a far easier task of separating believers from one another and that accomplishes the same purpose of separating us from Jesus Christ. Think about this. Think about it. Pray about it. What I quoted before, then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, that the ex to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've done a lot of counseling in, in my ministry over the years, and I've had people come to me and say, well, you don't understand. I love the Lord, but I don't love my wife anymore. I say, you liar. I've, I've said that to you. I say, you liar. You're lying to yourself. You can't lie to me, and I promise you, you can't lie to God. You don't love God any more than you love that brother that you say, well, I don't like him no more. That's the word of God. You better be prepared to answer for that. That's why I'm saying if you have a problem, if you're separated, if, if unforgiveness has caused you to divide from somebody else, run to them. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't take your offering to the altar until, even if you know your brother has something against you, go to them. Deal with it. Don't tolerate the vision of the body of Christ. Because I'm going to tell you, God is not going to. Yeah. And if this is the last thing that Jesus prayed before going to the cross, it had to be very important. Oh, that's, oh my goodness It gracious. had to be very, very important. Trust me. It yes. is, to yes. quote my dear bride, <laughs> very, very important. Listen, I'm, okay, I'm going to get very serious here, and you may not like this. And if you don't, I hope you forgive me. <laughs> there are thousands. Mm. No, no. There are tens of thousands of denominations in the Christian church today. Those are divisions that we call good, yeah. that we boast in, that we celebrate. Oh, to recall the words of the prophet Isaiah who said, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. And people will say to me, Well, you don't understand, Brother Allen. Oh, those people down the street, they take up the offering before the announcements. 
We don't believe in that. Well, uh, you know, they baptize, they dip frontwards instead of dipping backwards. It's ridiculous. It would appear from the scriptures that I quoted, all these different scriptures, that the issue of unity is both significant and serious. It's something that the body of Christ needs to face and to deal with today. Now, I, I know, and I've been, in, I've been involved in this for 40 years, that there are efforts taking place in many areas towards an ecumenical movement. And while that may sound good, it must be approached prayerfully. Bear in mind that Satan is an imitator, a counterfeiter, often creating illusions of godly things. He's the one that said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Mm. Isaiah 14, 14. And Paul wrote to the Corinthians, again, 2 Corinthians, No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Mm. You know, not long ago, on another trip to where we were spending a lot of time over in the UK here, I was invited to go to a large interdenominational prayer meeting in Manchester, mm. not far from where we are right now. It was a monthly meeting organized by a group that has, they've had significant success in bringing together many people from many different denominations for fellowship. And, and while I salute that, I mean, I think that's, that's good, the effort, the underlying desire is good. Indeed, it's an idea that truly motivates my effort in writing this work. I felt compelled to tell them at that time that true unity in the body of Christ is not when Baptists and Lutherans and Episcopalians, etc., 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 come together to fellowship. Mm. True unity is when there are no more Baptists and Lutherans and Episcopalians and etc., and etc., but only people who follow the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, Amen. on those paths of righteousness that lead to the throne of the Father. For this is the truth. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Philippians 2, 9-11. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved, Acts 4.12. You know, I believe and give an honor to whom honor is due. And I thank the Lord for so many, for the faithfulness of so many who have gone on before us, used mightily by God, that great cloud of witnesses. I thank God for Luther and Wesley and Calvin, for John Huss, for Wycliffe, for all of these people that have gone on and sacrificed so much for us, for God, that we would have what we have today. But while I thank God for them and I, and I would honor them, I'm commanded to fix my eyes on Jesus Christ yes. and Jesus Christ alone. I don't want to be known by my relationship with men. Mm. I want to be known by the relationship I have with the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He and he alone is to be our focus. Wow. And he and he alone is what people should see in our lives. For you you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3.3. 3. Well, hallelujah. We're pretty much out of time. So, Father, I just want to thank you, Lord God. Lord, that you have put your Holy Spirit in us. Lord, you have given us all the same truth. You have given us all the same word. You have given us all that same gift of salvation. May we walk in it for your glory, Lord God. Unite us. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Unite us, Lord God. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye.